Australophilia. If you've never heard of this coral, it is understandable. For years, this coral has been known as Symphilia, and for a short stint, it was on Team Lobophilia, but around 2016, it was given its own genus. The Australophilia we typically see in the hobby now is Australophilia wilsoni, and they are found mainly in Western Australia. The thing about Western Australia is that the collection sites can differ from one another substantially when it comes to temperature. Some have suggested that there might be multiple species of Australophilia, some that are tropical in nature, that like temperatures in the 78 to 80 range, and cooler water varieties that like temperatures closer to about 75 degrees, maybe even a little bit cooler. It's hard to say which one is which and how adaptable they are to temperature. Some hobbyists struggle with this coral, so one possible solution is to lower the temperature slightly in case you got one of the colder water varieties. This hobby likes to list almost every coral as rare or unique to drum up some excitement for a particular specimen, but Australophilia are actually uncommon to find in the wild. As a result, this coral is one of the more rare large polyp stony corals in the industry, which is kind of a shame because they are exceptionally beautiful corals. They have insane color patterns and come in a variety of colors, which makes them fun to track down and collect for those looking for a showpiece LPS that is kind of off of the mainstream path. Now that we've gone over some background info on Australophilia, let's dive into their care requirements. First care tip, let's go over lighting. Australophilia are photosynthetic corals, meaning they have a symbiotic relationship with dinoflagellates living in their flesh, called zooxanthellae. Strictly speaking, the zooxanthellae are the organisms carrying out the photosynthesis, but the coral animal benefits by accessing the byproducts of that photosynthetic activity, namely the simple sugars that are being produced. Australophilia, like many other LPS corals, regulates the population of zooxanthellae in its flesh. You may notice that a particular specimen gets a little darker as it builds up zooxanthellae, or it expels a brown paste from its mouth, which is essentially excess zooxanthellae. And once it does so, the colony might get a little bit lighter over time. As for how much light to provide, we don't really make any special accommodations for these corals. We primarily keep Australophilia in low to medium light intensity, which is around 50 to 100 par. Most types of Australophilia are adaptable to different lighting intensities, but the first priority should always be to not blow the coral away with light. It doesn't really take very much overexposure to negatively impact corals. It can lead to bleaching and a rapid decline in health. The additional light might also exacerbate the temperature issue that we talked about earlier. So too much light may cause both a negative effect in light exposure as well as elevated temperatures. It is far better to provide substandard lighting intensity and slowly correct that situation by adjusting the light or relocating the coral into brighter areas of the tank. Rather than accidentally blasting the Australophilia with too much light, and then trying to nurse it back to good health after it bleaches. That tends to go really poorly. Once these corals start to go downhill, it is challenging to reverse that trend. One aspect of lighting that might be interesting to pursue is the type of lighting and color spectrum. Here, we typically have corals under Ecotech radions with a very blue spectrum. The Australophilia have taken on a few different shades of red, blue, and teal, but I wonder if their appearance would change substantially if given a different type of light altogether. Some LPS varieties really change color while others stay more or less consistent. Now, I haven't yet tried to do anything like this, but it would not surprise me if changing the light spectrum or growing them under T5 would alter their look. Direct feeding is something I wholeheartedly recommend for Australophilia. This coral changes dramatically in size when fed. I can immediately tell when specimens are recently imported wild colonies 
versus the ones we grow for long-term aquaculture purely based on how much their size and shape have changed. When these corals get settled in and are eating well, they grow huge. They almost resemble a trachea brain where before they might have looked a little bit more like a maize brain. I've been feeding them primarily frozen shrimp, both krill and mysis for some time. But recently, I've been trying some powdered plankton foods. It's hard to pay attention to every coral's feeding habits, but I decided to shoot some time lapses of this coral, eating first just frozen, then a mix of frozen and some refroids, and then lastly, just refroids. At least with these specimens, it looks like they took to the powder foods pretty well, so that's something to pay attention to. Let's move on to water flow. Australophilia appreciate low to medium flow. There's two things that I'm looking to accomplish with this. The first is to give it enough flow to keep it clean. Detritus buildup can cause the coral to die back where it collects. Generally speaking, Australophilia do a pretty good job of sloughing off a lot of that material, but you do want to help it out a little bit on the flow end. Providing elevated flow around the coral can prevent that accumulation and even moderate flow can serve to keep the coral clean, so don't neglect that aspect of it. As far as too much flow, you will know you're overdoing it if the flow is slamming on the one side of the coral and it's drawn tight to the skeleton all the time. If this sort of flow isn't adjusted, it can cause the coral to die as the tissue will rub against the skeleton causing damage. If you're feeding the coral and it balloons up like we talked about, you're going to easily see if it's getting too much flow. So back things off the pumps if you can adjust them, or move the coral to a lower flow area of the tank. Providing periodic low flow, or even zero flow, is beneficial for this coral for the purposes of feeding. In the case of the powdered foods, I recommend zero flow for about 20 minutes to give the coral the best opportunity to swallow the food, as any flow tends to scatter, and that can lead to some of the problems people are having with overfeeding. That is a nice segue into the topic of recommended water chemistry for Australophilia. There are problems associated with overfeeding, so let's talk about phosphate and nitrate. Phosphate and nitrate are great general measurements of water cleanliness. They show up mainly in the food that we provide the tank, but decaying plant and animal matter in the aquarium can also elevate their levels in the water. At Tidal Gardens, we shoot for about 5 to 10 parts per million nitrate and 0.05 to 0.1 parts per million phosphate. If nitrate levels get too high, corals may react negatively by taking on a slightly drab coloration or, in the extreme case, suddenly dying back. If phosphate levels are too high, it may feed into unwanted algae blooms or spur the growth of other undesirable organisms that can stifle the growth of corals. If given the choice, I would much prefer to have too much nutrient rather than too little. For a short period, there was this trend in the hobby to have near zero levels of nitrate and phosphate. And there's a couple of ways to accomplish that, either with carbon dosing or GFO. Those methods can aggressively bring those numbers down. Now, ultra low nutrient levels come with their own set of issues, especially with LPS like Australophilia. There is definitely such a thing as too clean, and I would argue that the problems caused by near zero nutrient levels are much worse than those caused by abundance of nitrate and phosphate. Corals require some level of nitrate and phosphate available to them at all times. When they get starved out, the corals can take on first a shrunken and emaciated look, as well as possibly bleaching even, and then the die-off starts. After that, there is a risk of blooms of unwanted organisms such as brown dinoflagellates that thrive in ultra-low nutrient conditions. Aside from the water cleanliness parameters of the tank, you will want to make sure that the major ions for skeletal growth are in the healthy range. These LPS require consistent levels of calcium alkalinity and to some degree magnesium in order to grow their calcium carbonate skeleton. People often ask what those levels should be, and I always answer, just try to stick something to near natural seawater levels with an emphasis on maintaining consistency rather than specific values. 
I would go as far as saying it's better to have suboptimal levels of calcium, alkalinity, and magnesium and keep it consistent rather than trying to fix low levels with aggressive additions of additives. All right, let's talk about each one of those really briefly in turn. Calcium is one of the major ions in salt water. In the ocean, its level hovers right around 425 parts per million. As the coral grows, that calcium is absorbed and then deposited as its skeleton. Alkalinity is a collection of ions that generally equate to the carbonate availability in the water. Officially, it is the amount of acid required to lower the pH of salt water to the point that bicarbonate turns into carbonic acid. If you have more alkalinity, it can soak up more acid. Less alkalinity, and you have less buffering capacity, making the tank more susceptible to these chemical changes. In practice, alkalinity tends to be the parameter that fluctuates the most. In natural seawater, the alkalinity of the water measures right around 7 or 8 dKH. Though in the reef aquarium hobby, most people keep it a little bit elevated between 8 to 9 dKH. And that's kind of the range that we shoot for. Now, some hobbyists like to overload this parameter and they keep their tanks right around 10 to 11. It might help with stony coral growth, but we tend to be a little bit more conservative in that regard and stick to the 9 to 10 range. If you are experiencing low levels, say, for example, low alkalinity, you can add supplements to boost it. But first, double check with your test results to make sure that you're actually experiencing low levels. Test kits are not perfect, so it is good to double check before you start being too proactive, I guess. Once you do decide to take on some kind of activity, make sure to slowly change it over the course of weeks until you reach that level that's more in line with natural seawater. If you're having trouble maintaining calcium and alkalinity, keeping an eye on magnesium can help because raising both calcium and alkalinity together can be tricky because they interact with one another. Calcium ions and carbonate want to react. Addition of a calcium supplement often comes with a corresponding fall in alkalinity and vice versa. If you're experiencing this in your systems, it's normal by the very nature of those ions but it's something that you want to try and minimize. If you're experiencing dramatic swings of calcium and alkalinity every time that you use an additive, you might want to pay closer attention to your magnesium. In short, magnesium acts to increase the overall bioavailability of alkalinity compounds, and that provides more chemical stability. In the ocean, magnesium sits at about 1350 parts per million. That should give you a little bit of a background on the, on the chemical parameters to keep an eye on. Moving on to farming and aquaculture. Typically, a relatively slow-growing large polyp stony coral like Australophilia would be an unattractive candidate for long-term commercial aquaculture. Here's the thing though. Australophilia are actually rare in the wild. So long-term, propagation might be necessary to have these corals available in the industry in the future. While they're not the fastest growing coral, they do propagate fairly well. They cut and heal well from a cut with a bandsaw. They have multiple mouths for feeding, so each cutting has a good chance of recovery after cutting. Like with almost every coral, you probably have the best luck propagating them once they start growing so we prefer to only start cutting pieces that have been in our systems for a while. Okay, that about does it for Australophilia. So what kind of tank do I think Australophilia is best suited for? I see them as a showpiece LPS for that hobbyist that's looking for something different. Not too many people are even aware of this particular coral, and there are some amazingly beautiful examples out there. I personally am on the lookout to find some of the more exotic color variants that I've seen only pictures of. Ours are mostly a mix of red, blue, and teal, but I have seen other pictures where there's some that are hot pink or even bright yellow. Hopefully this video is helpful for those looking to try them for the first time. If you would like more information or purchase Australophilia for your home aquarium, I invite you to visit us at TitleGardens.com and see what we have in stock. Like I said, 
We are always on the lookout for the new and interesting color morphs of this coral to add to our collection, and hopefully yours as well. Until next time, happy reefing, guys.